Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And this is the day the Lord has made and he loves it when we gather to him and worship and love him and be thankful for his mercies and his goodness and kindness and faithfulness. I mean, he deserves all the glory and uh, he's chosen each one of us to be a part of his wonderful plan in the earth. And, uh, and aren't we blessed to be able to be part of God's plan? And in fact, that's what I'm going to speak on tonight. It's, uh, it's a topic that I've called Be Blessed. And this is part two. And I'll just do a little bit of a recap on part one, just so that no one's missing out. And in part one, we learned that to be blessed means to be fortunate. And who desires to be blessed? All the hands went up. Yes, yes. And God's blessings are both spiritual and natural. And God's blessings are available. However, ev for every person to access God's, access God's blessings, one must first believe that God exists and then serve him. And I'm just going to open my King James Bible to Romans chapter 3. And we read here in verse 23. And it says here, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so that's you and me. All have sinned. God's standards are holy, righteous, and his standards. And, and there's another scripture that says, there's none good. No, not one. All of us fall short of God's standards. And why is that? Because of sin. And sin separates us from God and his blessings. However, God is love and he loves his creation. And what could be done about that great gulf of sin that separates mankind from a holy and pure God. God who is three, he's God the Father, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit, and they had a plan. And God the Word would be born as a man and named Jesus. And Jesus demonstrated God's love and forgiveness to people. And Jesus who is without sin, suffered the penalty of our sin. He took the punishment when he died on the cross, bearing our sin, our guilt, and our shame. And I'm just going to turn over to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And we read here, and it says, If we confess our sins, he, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll read it from the Amplified. It says, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promise and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness and continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will in purpose, thought and action. So that said, if we confess our sins, we're not confessing our sins to another person. We're confessing our sins to God. We, a person's not going to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Only God can. And so, and there's only one mediator between God and us, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. We don't go through a Pope. We don't go through Mary. We don't go through Buddha. We don't go through any other gods. Jesus is the only one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we go to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we confess sin and he cleanses us. If we do it genuinely from our heart, he cleanses us and it's just like pure again. Our hearts become pure and praise God. And so believing that Jesus died for us and receiving God's forgiveness and us turning away from sin and following God's ways as shown in the Bible, that then allows us to serve God and receive his blessings. All right? We turn away from our own ways. We turn away from it and turn towards God and follow God's ways as shown in the Bible. God's given us his word so that we'll know God's will. This is God's word. It's two testaments and a testament is a will. And people we know, people in natural, you know, create a will, don't they? And they say, this is what I want to happen. This is what I want to happen. And so at their passing, 
the will is, um, there's an ex, ex executor of the will and he makes sure that it all what's in the will comes to pass. Well, God has given us his will and he has the Holy Spirit and he sent Jesus and uh, he's overseeing the will to making sure it comes to pass. And so where do we read about God's blessings? Because God has promised us blessings. You know, in a natural will, parents will leave things for their children. Well, how much more our Heavenly Father has things for his spiritual children? That's us. And if we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where do we find, read about God's blessings? In his word. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the Amplified says, Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose and action. God's given us his word to train us in his ways. So all scripture, that's every scripture, has been in, has, is the inspired and breathed out word of God. And it tells the truth about God's will and God's promises, which are his blessings to us. And so all the Bible is God's word. It's written down just so we know and understand God's will for us. And all the promises written in God's word are the blessings to those who believe. We have to believe. He, he's called us to be believers. And, and it's not just only believing. We also need to serve him. And so there'll be a demonstration and action and obedience to God's word in our lives. So God desires his creation to be blessed. That's you and me. And we read what the Lord says in the following. I'm just going to turn back, just give a quick overview here, turning back to Genesis chapter 1. And we're just going to look at a few people that God promised blessing to. Genesis chapter 1, because we said all scripture is profitable. Genesis chapter 1, God promised to bless Adam. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. It says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, and he made him male and female, created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And then Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. All right, the next one is Noah, chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. And it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Chapter 12 is Abraham, chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. And this is what the Lord said. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And chapter 22, chapter 22, verse 17 and 18, it says here, that in blessing, this is the Lord saying, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. All right, he's going to have a seed. Abraham's promised a seed, and Abraham was promised two seeds. And there's a principle in God, first the natural, then the spiritual. The sand seed, the natural seed, speaks of all the natural Jews all down through time. But the star seed speak of whatever is in heavenly is spiritual. And that speaks of God's spiritual seed, us through Jesus Christ. He is the promised seed and we've been gathered into that. And Abraham is the father of all who believe. And Genesis 24 Verse 1, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Not some things. Abraham was blessed in all things. Hallelujah. 
And Abraham had a son called Isaac. And Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, and it says, And then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And Isaac had a son called Jacob, and Genesis 28, verse 1, And Asa, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, verses 3 and 4, And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a sojourner, which God gave unto Abraham. All right, we know natural Israel, they went into a natural land, but we are the church, spiritual Israel, and this is the land of promise. All this Bible is full of promises, and God wants us to possess all these beautiful blessings that God's put in his word. And so if you don't read your word, how are you going to know what God's promised to do in your life? So it's all in the word. Hallelujah. And he's given it to us to understand it. And then Jacob, he had a son called Joseph. And we go to Genesis 39. And it says here in verses 2 and 3, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Is that what happens to you in the workplace? You know, is the business where you're working blessed because you're there? Hope so, you know. Hallelujah. And then what about Moses and the people of natural Israel? Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. And we read here. In verse 7, it says, For the Lord thy God has blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knows thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord thy God has been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. God provided for natural Israel, so they lacked nothing. Such was their blessing. Praise God. And so... From all these examples, we understand that God is no respecter of persons. We looked at each person then, all blessed, 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 because they followed the Lord. And God is a giving God. And so how do we access these blessings? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. And we're going to read some of the blessings for us, just verses 1 and 2. We'll start there. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So what was the requirement to receive the blessings? To hearken, and that means to listen, and to pay attention to the voice of the Lord. And what's the voice of the Lord? His word, right? God spoke his word. We read that before. God spoke his word and men wrote it down, all right? And what were they required to do? To observe and do it. That means they were to obey it. And then in, we're just uh, in verses 3 to 14, we read of many of the Lord's blessings, including health, wealth, long life, marriage, children, relationships, business, lending to others, and every success in every area of life, wherever you are. It's wherever you are. And let's just read them. Just starting verse 3 here, it says here, Blessed shalt thou be in the city. So it's wherever you are. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when you come in, and blessed shalt thou be when you go out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in and to thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thy hand to do. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. 
And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he is sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, and in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, to give the rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. However, from verse 15 to the end of the chapter, we read of the curses that come on people's lives due to disobedience to God's word. And I'll just read verse 15. It says, but, thou shalt, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. God will not bless disobedience. And then God uses the rest of that chapter through to verse 68, advising all the consequences of disobedience, which includes sickness, lack, everything goes wrong for them, uncontrollable lusts, bondages, depression, various addictions, terrible fear, anxiety, plagues, and eventually eternal death. So there's a whole lot of scriptures that carries all the curses for disobedience. So what stops the blessing in our lives? Now we've just read how God wants to bless everybody. So what stops the blessings flowing into our lives? The answer is unforgiveness and disobedience will block God's blessings in our lives. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and we read here just in verse 25. Mark. And it says here, and this is Jesus saying this. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it, let it go, in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your failings and shortcomings. So we need to understand that if we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us. And so we will not go to heaven. And to be clear, there is no one and no situation worth missing out on he God's blessing on our lives and or us spending eternity in hell. Just because somebody did something or something happened and we were so offended or so resentful or just so angry and just couldn't get past it, that's unforgiveness. And that will stop God's blessings coming on our life and if we don't get it sorted out, it will stop us going to heaven. Because he just, Jesus just said, if we don't forgive others, our heavenly father's not going to forgive us. So how important is forgiveness? And as believers, we have received God's forgiveness. Like we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, receiving him. And God knows everyone is not perfect. 
Even so, he requires us to walk in love and forgiveness towards all people. I mean, Jesus even said, love your enemies. He didn't say, love just the ones who love you. He expects us to walk in love. All right, so do you consider yourself a wise person or a foolish person? Let's read what Jesus said. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. And we read here in verses 24 and onwards there, it says, Jesus saying, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, right? So they're hearing the word and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man or a wise person, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So we read here about two houses, two lives, two people. And from the outward appearance, they may look similar. They may look Wow, that looks a really good person. Wow, they look, you know, but you know, God looks on the heart. And so what was the difference between the wise and the foolish person? The wise man, he heard the word and he obeyed it. The foolish man, he also heard the word. So he's in church, he's in the word, he's heard it, but he did not obey it. So how foolish is that? The wise man, he built his house, his life on the rock. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. The rock speaks of the word of God and the sand speaks of natural things. And God is going to use his word to test the foundation of every house, every life, every person. And only the rock, Jesus Christ, the word is stable. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And sand is is definitely unstable and will cause the house to fall. You know, ever been down the beach and you've built a beautiful sand castle and decorated with shells and twigs and so forth and it's beautiful, you think it's all beautiful and then a big wave comes and goes crash and it's just gone, right? It's just because it washed away, it was on sand. And so what tested both the houses? The rain. And what is the rain? The word, according to Deuteronomy 32, I'll read it one and two. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the, stew, as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. So rain is the word of God in scripture. That's what it's talking about, rain, the word of God. And God's word is going to test what kind of a foundation we have in our heart. And God allows testings to come to every life. And along with the rain, it, we just read there, there was, there was rain, but there was also floods, right? And floods come from an abundance of rain. And we are in the sixth day, the 6,000th year from the sin of Adam, and there's a double portion of the word available. And God's word is going out into every nation and it is checking the foundation in every heart. And the other testing was the winds. And winds can speak of winds of doctrine. And people believe this, and then they believe this, and then they believe this, and then they want to follow this person, they want to follow this person. We need to follow God and his word. He's given us his word. It's the, and I use the King James Bible that has stood the test of time. And the winds can speak of winds of doctrine. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, I've always had a prayer in my heart. You know, Lord, I only want to know the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I don't want man's opinion. I don't want man's ideas. I just want your word. And um, God's been very faithful to me of that because I just stayed with the word, stayed with God, stayed with the word, and I'm hungry for the word. Are you hungry for the word? Because he said, if, if we delight ourselves in him, he'll give us the desire of our heart. And if we just want the truth, God will make a way where we can hear truth and not heresy, not false doctrine, not rubbish. We want the truth. 
And it says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Well, that no more children. He's not talking about children, literally natural children. He's talking about spiritual children, right? We, we, we get saved and we're meant to grow spiritually. And all doctrine needs to line up with the word of God. And that's why I'm really big on having Bibles because you need to check out whatever anybody's saying. Don't take their word for it. I mean, in a nice way, but check it out with the scriptures. Make sure you follow on with the word because if you don't know the word, you are very open to being deceived. So we need to stay in the word and read the word when people are speaking and, and uh, just look at the word. And let's read it from the Amplified, verse 14. So then we may no longer be children, tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. The prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. At salvation, we are a spiritual baby. However, just like in the natural God desires us to grow up spiritually. And God uses his word to feed us spiritually. You know, could you imagine if you've been in God 30 years and yet you're really a spiritual baby because you've never fed on the word of God. You might be, you could be in your 70s and you're still a spiritual baby. God wants you to have full spiritual truth so you grow up spiritually. On the other hand, you could be someone in thir who's 30 years old, but you've been around the word of God and you've hungered after it and you've drawn on it and God's fed you and you've grown spiritually. It's not a matter of natural age. We are what we eat. And so if we eat spiritual food, we will grow spiritually. And as we grow spiritually, we learn more about God's desire to bless our lives and how to qualify ourselves to be on the receiving end of his blessings. And so when we hear and obey God's word, that makes a way for his blessings to flow in our lives. All right. So what are some of the other blessings shown in scripture? There are so many blessings shown that are available when we serve God and they are both spiritually, spiritual and natural. So number one is eternal life. That is got to be number one blessing, eternal life. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And it says here in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. So sin brings ultimate death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. Not any other way. Like I said before, he's the way, the truth and the life. The gift of God. It's a gift. God wants to give you eternal life. Praise God. And John 3.16. John 3.16. And we read here. For God so loved the world. That's you and me. That he gave his only begotten son, being Jesus. That whosoever believes in him, Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants to save people. What is he going to save us from? Eternity in hell. Nobody in their right thinking would ever want to spend eternity in a flaming fire. And so that we don't perish. He said, he, when we believe in him, we won't perish. And that word perish, it means to lose, to mar, to perish, to be destroyed and die. God doesn't want our lives destroyed. God doesn't want us marred or perishing or, um, or dying before our time even or eternal death. Jesus came to give us eternal life. Hallelujah. I'd rather choose Jesus, eternal life. And let's turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, because we're talking about being blessed. Saved is being blessed. And Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. 
Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, in whose the spirit there is no guile. The Amplified says, Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied, is he who has forgiveness of his transgression continually exercised upon him, whose sin is covered. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit, no lying. Like God wants to cleanse us from all sin. Hallelujah. And when we believe in the Lord, turning from our own ways, turning to him, uh, our lives, we can receive eternal life and be cleansed. So instead of spending eternity in a fiery hell, we can be forgiven, blessed and spend eternity in heaven. Does that sound like a blessing? Absolutely. All right. Number two, reconciliation to God. Let's turn to Romans chapter five. And it says here, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were because of sin, right? If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, being Jesus, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Praise God. And Colossians chapter one, verse 21 Colossians 1 verse 21, and it says here, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has been reconciled. Our sin separates us from God. Yet once we turn to God and repent of our sin, we are reconciled to God. Hallelujah. All right, number three, salvation. Imagine if you were out at sea and a huge wave swept you over the side of the boat, causing you to sink, like you're in the water, right out to sea, starting to sink. And if no one came to your rescue and throw you a life jacket, you would drown. You would die. And sin in our lives causes us to drown within and eventually die eternally being separated from God. However, we just turn back to Romans chapter 10. It says here, Romans 10 verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And saved means to be healed, preserved, to be made well, to be made whole, spirit, soul and body. And what are we saved from? Eternal separation from God. Just a quick testimony. Someone told me of a, a man they knew and he was out, out in the sea snorkeling, probably going after crayfish or other fish. And, um, and he just happened to turn and here comes this really big, very long shark. And, and the man just kind of just tried to get amongst the kelp and so forth. But this shark sort of swam away. And then... He comes around again and this time the shark opened his mouth and put his fins and he was coming straight for the man. Now this man was not a believer, but I tell you what he did. He said, oh God, please help me. Oh God, please save me. Oh God, please help me. And you know what? That shark was coming right at me saying, God, please help me. God, please help me. And then the shark just turned and went away. Now, I don't know if that man saved, but he certainly got a second chance at life because he knew he was a goner. But it says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so God saved that man that day, but he wants him to find God and follow in God's ways, not just to go back and continue his own ways. Because imagine if you got saved that day from that terrible situation and then still ends up in hell. Well, how ridiculous that would be. He was rescued. God's given him a second life. And let's just believe that God will make a way where he'll actually come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Praise God. All right. Number four, we're brought into God's kingdom of light. There's only two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And everyone on this planet is in one of those kingdoms. There's no gray. You're either serving God or serving the devil. There's no gray. And before, that, before we call out to God, we are, because of sin, in the kingdom of darkness. However, when we call out to God to save us, he brings us out of the kingdom of, it brings us 
he brings us into the kingdom of light. Like we were born in sin. We we're born in iniquity, doing the wrong thing. No one taught us how to sin. It just came natural because it's in our bloodstream. But when we really call out to God sincerely and say, look, I'm done with this life. I want to go your way, God. God brings us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the light. And if we turn over to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, and it says here, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, it says here, 5 verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness, like in the world of sin, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Right? We were in darkness, but now we're in the light and we are to walk the walk. And First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we read here in verse 5. It says here, you are all the children of light. Like that's the believers, okay? And the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. You know, we're not a believer just because we say we are. That doesn't make you a believer. As believers, we are to be an excellent witness to those around us, how we behave, whether we are at wherever we are, at the shops, at the workplace, everywhere, even how we drive, for example, obeying the road laws and so on. You know, we are God's representatives. He's ambassadors in the earth to those around us. All right. People are reading you. You may not. Sometimes you may not even open your mouth, but people are watching. They're listening. They're looking. And we need to walk the walk and not be hypocrites. You know, with God's help, like we need God's help to walk the walk. Praise God. Number five, let's turn to Ephesians 33. Sorry, uh, Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Number five is God has specially chosen you. Psalm 33, verse 12. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And if we turn over to John 15, we're going to read what Jesus said. John 15 and verse 16, it says, Jesus saying this, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So we ask the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for things. We don't have to go to somebody or send a prayer request. We go to the Father. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father. Hallelujah. Yes, we can do a prayer of agreement, of course. But Jesus said, we can ask the Father. And with God's help, we are to bring forth fruit of repentance, which means we stop committing deliberate sin. And when people see you, they should recognize you as a believer because there's godly fruit showing. In other words, we do not behave or speak like the unsaved. We're in the light. We're the children of light. And 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 9. And it says here, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Did you know you are a priest? If you're a believer, God calls you a priest. He says, I've chosen you to be a royal priesthood. It's not about priests in this natural world. God wanted a kingdom of priests. Back in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, God brought the children of Israel out and he wanted a holy priesthood. He wanted them all to be priests. 
But because of disobedience, he ended up using one tribe, Levi, to be the priesthood. But God has never changed his plan. And here we are right down this end of the age through Jesus Christ. God is going to have a royal priesthood. And it's for all believers, not just a special select group. It's for all believers and that a peculiar people. That means a special people to show forth the praise of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. And the Amplified says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's a king priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that great that we are to, we're to show forth God, godly deeds, right? Being kind, loving <laughs> and display the virtues of God. All right, be the witness, be the example. Number six, having a relationship with God. Serving God is not about religion. It's about having a relationship with God. Ephesians chapter two. God's not into religion. God doesn't, he's not into religion. There's a lot of religion going on in the world, but it's not a God. Where God is, there's life, there's peace, there's joy. You want God in the house, not just a form of, of um, idols. Or, or And look, there's plenty of churches where people, and even just um, ah, different gatherings all over the world that bow down to all sorts of idols. You know, And God said, thou shalt not have any idols, and you're not to bow down to any idols. So, you know, we just need to be aware what's going on round about. And that's all sorts of religions. And I say, I mean, religions, religions bow down to idols and it's an abomination to God. And so because he's God, he wants us to bow down to him. And he said, don't make any statutes to bow down to. That's an abomination. And yet there's plenty of groups that have statutes. Or pictures of Jesus and Jesus he didn't have his face was so marred and so forth by the time they finished with him he didn't want anybody to have he didn't want to be have pictures of him right because he wants us to worship God worship God all right so Ephesians where do we get to we're talking about uh, where did we get to here brought into his kingdom of light Specially chosen you. The relationship, that's it. So it's not about religion. And Ephesians 2, verse 13, it says here, But now in Christ Jesus, you are you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Right? We were way away from God. God's will, God's plan, God's standards, God's way. But because of Jesus Christ, he's just brought us into relationship with God. It's just one. He's our heavenly father. That's the father. In fact, Jesus said, call no man father. Jesus said, call no man father. Because there's only one father, God the father, God the word, which we became God the son and God the Holy Spirit. And 1 John, 1 John right down the back, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. God loves each person so much. He proved his love by sending Jesus and Jesus was willing to come and die. He gave his life for us. We love him because we first, he first loved us. And you know, we don't even have to clean ourselves up before God, God will accept us. No, we don't have to say, oh, I've got to just, I've got to, no, we come to God just as we are. And Romans chapter five, Verse 8, it says here, But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? While we were still in sin, Christ died for us. The Amplified says, verse 8, But God shows and clearly proves his love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ the Messiah, the anointed one, died for us. Isn't that wonderful? And then once we're saved, we're to learn God's way and turn from our own ways and follow God's ways. Hallelujah. We don't just keep staying in a muddle. God wants to 
uh, bless our lives, help us in our lives and walk with us. He's to be included in our lives, in that relationship. It's not like, oh, we only talk to God on a Sunday or a particular time of the day. He wants to be with us all the time. And in fact, he is. But he wants that relationship. Have you ever had a, um, oh, I'll give an example, a, a man and a woman who are in love, right? They're in love. And they just want to be together. They want to talk. They want to share everything. They just want to, just can't get enough. And they're thinking about each other. He wants us in love with him. Sharing our life with him. Not just a certain time of the day or a particular place we go to or um, a particular day. He wants us every day in him. It's a relationship. Praise God. And number seven, God has a wonderful plan for your life. God desires to uh, lead and guide you into the fullness of his wonderful plan for your life. It's in this book and he's got the plan for your life. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter one. And it says here, verse 17, start there. It says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants us to know, have revelation of him. The eyes of your understanding, that's your spiritual eyes of understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Did you know God's got a call on your life? And what the true riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. God's exceeding greatness of power towards us. He's, he is almighty God. He is all powerful. And 1 Corinthians, just turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And it says here, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Right? There's that relationship again. I has not seen nor ear heard neither entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So, you know, we're not to limit God and, and we mustn't limit what he wants to do in our lives. And how's he going to do it? And why is he going to do it? Because we love him. What he wants to do in our lives is because we love him. He loves us. We said that before. He loves us before we even loved him. But he wants to just help us in our lives fulfill. He wants your life to be so abundant, so meaningful, you have no idea. It says you can't think about it. You've never heard about it. You don't even fully understand. But as God's plans start to unfold in your life, look out. He wants you to have an abundant, meaningful life. All right. And nearly there. Number eight is rewards. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 6, and it says here, But without faith it's impossible to please him, please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, that means that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not half-heartedly seek him, or occasionally, or just a certain time of the year. He wants to reward those, bless those that seek him diligently. And regarding faith, you know, it's, we must, we, we need faith, right? We have what I call natural faith. Otherwise, we'd never get on an aeroplane or drive across a bridge. Like, we have faith. We're going to get to the other side, don't we? That's, I call that natural faith. However, the faith that this scripture is talking about is about having faith in God. Faith in God means we trust God no matter what. We trust God. Our trust is in God, not in politicians, not in our finances, not in our, our abilities. Our trust has to be in God. And we believe, faith is believing that God meant what he said in his word. It's a good definition of faith. Faith is believing that God meant what he said in his word. And he said that I'll reward them. That rewarder in the scripture means remuneration or payment for believing. You, we can't outgive God. He wants his blessings to come into our lives. 
And let's turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And we read here verse 7. And it says here, The law, that's the word of God, the Lord is perfect. Converting, that means restoring the whole person. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord, that's the word of God, is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear, that's the reverential fear of the Lord, is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. You know, how many people go after the gold or the material things? And then God doesn't mind us blessing us with the things that we need. And he doesn't mind so long as the things don't have us. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his right ways, and all the things will be gathered. He doesn't want us going after the things and miss out on him. All right. So we go after God and his blessings chase us down. And, in, and the word of God, it warns us if we're going a bit of a stray or we've just pulled back or whatever, say, come on, back you get on onto it. Come on, back you get straighten up, whatever. You know, he loves us. He corrects us. He wants to bring adjustment to our lives if we need it. Uh, pull our head in if we need it. And, um, and in keeping of his word, there's great reward. Isn't that wonderful? So in keeping and obeying God's word, there's great reward. And there can be no doubt that for those who obey God's word and diligently, diligently seek him, there is great reward. Hallelujah. And the last one we look at today is length of days, long life and peace within. You know, everyone desires to have a long life and peace. However, outside of God and that relationship with him, we are empty within. God made us that way. There is nothing in this world although how enjoyable and pleasant and exciting that might be, that will satisfy spiritual hunger. God made us that way. Nothing will satisfy what in our heart, in the very most in being in our heart, except God. And so that we can, without God, we are empty within and we have no real ongoing and satisfying purpose in this life. And we actually lack true and lasting peace within. And the good news is that God's word promises us length of days, long life and peace. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3, last scripture. Proverbs chapter 3. And we read here verses 1 and 2. It says, My son or my daughter, forget not my law, that's his word, but let your, let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. And the Amplified says, my son, I'll say, and daughter, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments, keep my word, obey my word. For length of days and years of life worth living and tranquility inward and outward and continuing through old age till death. These shall they add to you. Praise God. These are wonderful blessings. Length of days, long life and peace within. That's amazing. So many people lack peace. They're so stressed, lacking peace, but it's only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this topic is going to be continued in part three. And we're going to discover more blessings that God desires for us. And everyone said, Amen.